In this video, you're going to learn how to determine the type of bond that would form between two elements. So it's all based on the fact that if an atom has unpaired electrons like this one right here, that's not a stable situation for that atom. Having pairs of electrons is stable. So this nitrogen atom has three unpaired electrons and would probably need to form three bonds in order to become stable. But there are three different types of bonds that could form. And what you're going to learn is how to figure out which type is going to form. It's all based on the electronegativity of the atoms that are forming the bond. So electronegativity is the measure of an atom's pull on electrons in a bond. So if this represented electrons and they were bonding this orange haired guy and this yellowed haired guy together, electronegativity is how hard each of those atoms is pulling on that pair of electrons. We look up electronegativity in a chart that looks just like the periodic table because almost every element has an electronegativity value. Notice that the noble gases don't have an electronegativity because they don't tend to form bonds. So therefore, they're not going to be pulling on electrons in a bond because they won't make any bonds. If you notice, this thing is a bit color coded and I like that. The darker colors mean the higher electronegativity value. And what we call the king of electronegativity is fluorine over here. Fluorine is very, very high. Some people just call it 4.0, but this chart shows it as 3.98 Paulings. Diagonally across the periodic table is the lowest electronegativity element, which is francium, at 0.7. So if these two were playing a tug of war together, fluorine would be pulling significantly harder on those electrons than the francium atom would. So what we do is we calculate the difference in electronegativity, and the symbol for that is delta En, because delta means change in, so we sort of look at the change in electronegativity between the two atoms. We would start here at zero, where there is no difference in electronegativity. We've got two, the exact same atom bonded together. The first hash mark here, um, different people argue about where it should be. Some people call it 0.3, some people call it 0.5. If you calculate the difference and it's somewhere around 0.3 or 0.5, that's the first cutoff mark. If your difference is in between here, we would call that a nonpolar covalent bond. And what that means, nonpolar, means there are not separate poles. It's going to be very evenly shared electrons. They are both pulling equally on those electrons. The next hash mark we see here is some people say 1.5, some people say 1.7, somewhere in here and higher. If the difference is that great, if the difference between one atom and another is 1.5 or higher, we would say an ionic bond would form here. What happens here is a complete transfer of electrons. So let's say this atom X had an electron and this atom Y is now going to receive that electron. And we end up with something completely negative and completely positive. So we go from evenly shared, where they both have the electrons, to the opposite end, which is one has lost an electron and the other one has gained an electron. Then we sort of have this fuzzy gray area in the middle in between nonpolar covalent and ionic, which is sort of a gradient that we call polar covalent bonds. In a polar covalent bond, there is still sharing, it's just not even. So let's say we have um, atom A and atom B. And if atom A has a much higher electronegativity value, it's going to have more access to the electrons. They're still being shared in between these, but atom B really has most of them, making it a little bit, that's a lowercase Greek letter delta, means a little bit negative, and then this guy, because it's not, it's sort of allowing the electrons to go over this way, little bit positive. So we usually say in this class that our range is 0 to 0 0.5 is going to be nonpolar covalent, 0.51 to 1.69, that in-between area is the polar covalent, 1.7 and higher, we would say an ionic bond is going to form. So here's a couple of examples of how we're going to calculate it. Let's say we're looking at Cl2, and what that means is two chlorine atoms are bonded together, and we're going to look at how are they pulling on those electrons. Well, one chlorine has an electronegativity value of 3.16. Well, it is bonded to another chlorine that has an electronegativity value of 3.16. We subtract those to get the difference in electronegativity, and when you subtract one number from itself, you get zero. So if we look at the chart, as di a difference of zero would say a covalent bond. So this would indicate a covalent bond is going to form, and what that means is each of them is pulling evenly, so the electrons are being shared evenly. 
So let's look at a different example. We've got hydrogen chloride. It's a hydrogen atom. Hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.20 bonded to a chlorine atom, 3.16. Well, we're going to subtract the smaller number from the bigger number and get the difference in electronegativity. So if you subtract those, we get 0.96. So if we look that up on the chart, 0.96 is going to fall in this range, so this would be a polar covalent bond. So what that means is that these are sharing electrons, but polar means uneven. So this big, strong, more electronegative chlorine atom has more access to the electrons, so it's going to be a little bit, that's that Greek letter delta again, a little bit negative. Since the hydrogen is sort of allowing its electrons to flow over this way, it's going to be a little bit, or delta, positive. The last example is calcium and chlorine. This would be calcium chloride. Notice that there are two chlorines. We don't really care about that when we're doing this calculation. All we want to know is what's the difference between chlorine and calcium. We don't have to do anything with this two because it's not like magnifying the electronegativity. We just know that chlorines have a value of 3.16, calcium has a value of 1.00. So if you subtract those to get the difference in electronegativity, it's 2.16. So we look them up on the chart, that's higher than 1.70. So this would be an ionic bond. What that means is that calcium is going to completely lose its electrons to chlorine. So calcium had two valence electrons, chlorine had seven. So calcium will lose one of its electrons over here to chlorine, but now chlorine has gained an electron, it's negative. Calcium still has one, that's why the second chlorine had to come in. It can receive the other one, and it will become negative when it gains that electron. Since calcium lost two, it's now positive two. So ionic sort of means I win. The more electronegative, the 3.16 wins, takes the electrons completely away from the weaker electronegative element, which would have been calcium in this case. So since we have different types of bonds forming, we're going to have different types of particles. When an ionic bond forms, they're not really stuck together. The chlorine and the sodium here are not really stuck together. They are attracted because of opposite charges. So this negative is attracted to this positive, and it's a repeating pattern of positives and negatives. So we would look at the simplest ratio of one positive to one negative, whatever adds up to zero, and that's called a formula unit and we do abbreviate that Fu. So the smallest particle would be this formula unit and we could count up that there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and it would keep going multiple formula units. But a covalent compound is different. They actually are stuck together. Picture this like ball and stick model. These represent bonds that are sticking a hydrogen atom to a carbon atom. So this is what we would call a molecule. And I don't know of a good abbreviation for molecule. Formula unit gets Fu, molecule. We can't go M, that's meters. We can't go MOL, that's moles. So then you might as well just finish out the word molecule.